Today, our uh, speaker is Matthias Caro, and uh, um, maybe you can start pulling up the slides. Uh, sure. Let's see whether that works as planned. Exactly, <laughs> it works. Yes. Uh, uh, so the talk of today will be uh, titled Out of Distributions and Realization for Learning Quantum Dynamics. So uh, feel free to start when you want, Matthias. Perfect. So thank you very much uh, for the introduction and for the invitation to talk here. So as Alessandro said, my name is Matthias. I'm uh, at Freie Universität Berlin. And uh, today it's my pleasure to tell you about out of distribution generalization for learning quantum dynamics. Um, this is work that we posted on the on the archive back in April under this identifier. And when I say we, um, that's myself and a group of great collaborators, uh, which are Robert, Nick, Joe, Andrew, Lukas, Patrick, and Zoe. Um, and it was a lot of fun to work on this project together with them. But so now let me um, first start by motivating what this talk is about, um, because it has some, like the, the title has several technical terms, and I hope that after the, after the talk, you know what the title means, and maybe can associate something with it. Let me start by giving you an intuition for what's called in-distribution generalization. This is um, something from classical machine learning theory, and roughly it's uh, a two-phase process. There is the first phase, which is the training of the machine learning model. So in supervised machine learning, you're provided some labeled data. Then you feed that data into a, into a machine learning model. And what that means is you have a model that, for example, depends on some parameters, uh, alpha, say the parameters in a neural network or something. And then you have a, usually an optimization loop um, that updates the parameters according to some success metric evaluated on the training data. And the outcome of such an optimization loop is then the trained machine learning model with an optimized parameter setting. And the optimized parameter setting depends on the training data that you saw. So that's the training phase. And then in, when thinking about generalization, there's something like a second phase, which is a testing phase. And in in-distribution generalization, we now test on data coming from the same source. So that means there is like an underlying source, let's say an underlying probability measure, from which we now draw a new data point, but without a label. And we feed that into the machine learning uh, model that we trained. And that then outputs a label. And the label produced by this machine learning model should be close to the true label of the data point that we, we got from the source. So that's in distribution generalization. And the way I've shown it here, it's uh, not necessarily classical or quantum. It's just some kind of machine learning model, uh, which could be quantum if you want. Now, what is out of distribution generalization, which I'll always abbreviate as OOD um, because that's going to appear often, and I don't have the time to write it out every time. So the training phase is exactly the same as before. So you still get labeled data drawn from some source. You have an optimization loop, and you produce the model. But the testing phase is different. In the testing phase, you're now tested on data from a different source. So that means that you get a data point, which of course has some similarities to the data you trained on. Otherwise, you're, you have no hope. Um, but it's not from the same data source. So it might be from a different probability distribution. But you still try the same thing. You, so you still try to give that as an input to the trained model and then produce a label. And you still want that that label is something like an accurate predictor of the label that, uh, of the true label that the source would have assigned the data point. So this is the difference between in distribution and out of distribution generalization. Um, if you want something like an analogy, in distribution generalization is a little bit like school where your teacher gives you exercises and then in the exam you have to solve an exercise that also the teacher created and that's very similar. Out of distribution generalization is a little bit more like study versus research. So you study until you get your degree and you get a lot of exercises, but research is a bit different. Um, still, it has something to do with studying. 
So that's a little bit more like out of distribution generalization. Now, let's specify a bit more what this has to do with a quantum model. In particular, I will uh, focus for this talk on variational unitary learning. So here um, you have first the training phase. And for this training phase, you can imagine that, uh, actually, can you see my mouse? Yes, okay, good. Uh, you yes, first, yes. Cool. You first draw a quantum state from some training ensemble. Uh, whenever I say ensemble, I mean probability distribution over states or unitaries. In this case, a probability distribution over states. And it's some probability distribution over states that generates an input state. Then you have the unknown target unitary that you're trying to learn. And using the state and the unitary, you can prepare training data, which is like pairs of input state, output state. Now, using that data, um, you try to optimize a quantum circuit with trainable gates. So when I say variational unitary learning, I just mean you have a unitary quantum circuit with some trainable parameters. So for example, you could have some rotation gates in there where the angle is trainable and parameterized by a classical parameter. And you try and update these classical parameters in an optimization loop and to then get something like an optimized parameter setting. Now, you could have two kinds of testing. In distribution testing would be where the testing ensemble is exactly the same ensemble that you trained on. You produce a state from that ensemble, feed it to your optimized variational unitary, and then you get some output state. And now that output state should be roughly the same that you would have gotten had you fed the state to the true target unitary, which you unfortunately don't know. Or you could have out of distribution testing where the testing ensemble is different from the training ensemble. You then draw a state from this different ensemble, feed it to your optimized unitary, get an output state. And you'd like that to be close to the output state you would have gotten if you had applied the true unitary. So that's what I mean when talking about in distribution versus out of distribution generalization for variational unitary learning. Does that make sense so far? All right. But um, sorry, here um, you are not doing any kind of tomography on the states uh, to to compare whether yeah. it, the thing uh, you produce is exactly the same you wanted. You, you, you. That's actually a very good question. Um, so how do we like actually have the data and how can we interact with it? Um, there are like multiple settings possible. So you could imagine getting classical descriptions of these quantum states. Um, and working with those. You could also imagine getting copies of these quantum states, and then you kind of have to work with the copies. Um, the costs that we're going to look at are always going to be something like overlaps between the output states or something. And these you can evaluate on a quantum computer using swap tests or something similar. So in that way, you can make it work even if you have only states and not like only copies and not classical descriptions. OK. Good. Why would you maybe care about variational unitary learning? Um, let me try to describe some potential use cases of this. A first one would be um, trying to understand some experimental quantum process. So let's say you have some, some black box U in your lab that implements some kind of unitary, and you're trying to figure out what it is. Now, what you could try would be, if you have a universal quantum computer at your disposal, uh, you could try to kind of let the quantum computer interact with the process in a way where you first prepare something, apply the unitary, then try to undo it with your variational unitary, and then in the end, basically measure and you should observe the state you started with. So in a sense, that would be like learning an unknown experimental quantum process. But maybe you don't have a universal quantum computer quite yet. Um, maybe you have like a restricted way that you can interact with the, with the quantum process you. Um, so this kind of restricted interaction also falls into our framework. Um, so this would be like learning a quantum process. You could also think about uh, something that uh, my collaborators at Los Alamos have done a lot of work on, namely quantum compiling. So here the idea would be you, you have this black box unitary U, which you don't really know, or maybe you know some things about it. 
But what you would like <clears throat> is a representation of you in terms of a quantum circuit with like two local gates or something. And then you could try a similar thing where uh, you have some input state, apply the unitary, try to undo it, and then check that you undid it correctly. Um, and then if you do this well, this parameterized quantum unitary would be a circuit representation of the true unitary. And this attempt of finding a circuit representation is, is not only um, possible with a quantum computer, you could also try to do this on a classical computer. That would then be classical compiling of a unitary into a quantum circuit. Um, so in all of these settings, it, um, a possible ansatz is to use a variational unitary and try to learn that. All right, so much for my motivation. Uh, let me try to um, give an overview of what I'll try to cover in the rest of the talk. So first, I want to give you a, a more mathematical setup of the problem. Um, and then I'll in particular tell you what kind of training and testing ensembles we look at. Uh, then come like the, the main theoretical results, which are uh, how locally scrambled risks relate to each other and some out of distribution generalization results. And then um, I hope to still have the time to show you some applications and numerical experiments um, before concluding and telling you some open questions. So let's, let's start with the framework. On a very high level, the framework is as follows. We want to learn an unknown n qubit unitary, u. And our ansatz for this is going to be a parametrized unitary quantum neural network. Uh, if you're not so familiar with the term quantum neural network, you can also think parametrized quantum circuit. Um, these terminologies are used somewhat interchangeably in the literature. And here we have some classical parameters, uh, which I called alpha. Alpha could be continuous parameters, like I said before, so rotation angles, for example. But it could also have discrete parameters that maybe tell you how many trainable gates your quantum neural network has or something like this. And now what you try to do, so the strategy is you use a quantum computer to evaluate whether a parameter setting performs well on available data and also to find directions in which you can improve essentially by evaluating gradients. So that's what the quantum computer does for you. But in this optimization loop that I had in my pictures before, the actual optimization is done by a classical computer. Um, so you use quantum computers to evaluate functions and gradients, but the optimization itself, so for example, the gradient descent is then done on a classical computer. Um, this is something you encounter quite often in variational quantum algorithms. And the idea is that uh, the optimization is potentially costly and not so easy to do on near-term quantum devices. So let's use the near-term devices for something they can actually do and uh, kind of outsource the optimization to a classical computer. All right, that's the high level view. Um, how do we formalize, formalize this mathematically? So first of all, we need a performance measure. So what is it that we want our model to be good at? What should a machine learning model or quantum machine learning model do? And what we're going to define is that it's going to achieve or it should achieve a small expected testing risk. Um, so here, here's the definition. If we have an unknown unitary U, which we're trying to learn, we have a unitary quantum neural network with some parameter setting alpha, and we have a testing ensemble P. So by that, I mean P is a probability distribution over n qubit quantum states. Then the performance measure that we're going to look at is basically the expected distance between the output states of U and the output states of V. So what you see here is um, uh, a trace distance between the output state of U and the output state of V of alpha when you plug in a state drawn from this ensemble and then we take an expectation. And then there's some bells and whistles. Uh, we like square because it's convenient and we have a factor one over four uh, because we want the thing to be between zero and one but essentially expected trace distance between output states. Okay, and the goal is always to achieve a small expected testing risk. So find the parameter setting alpha opt that uh, makes this small. Because that means if you draw a state, um, your expected output is gonna be, or in expectation, your output is gonna be close to the true output. There's an issue with this though. 
if you think of yourself as, as like the learner, uh, you don't know the unitary you because it's unknown and you're trying to learn it. And you also don't know the testing ensemble um, usually. So that means you have no chance of evaluating this expectation value directly. So we need to do something else. And the something else um, that we're going to try is to use a proxy. So instead of evaluating the expected testing risk, we try to work with a training cost as a proxy for it. So what does that mean? Um, we start from training data consisting of input states psi j and output states u psi j. And we assume that each of the psi j is drawn from some training ensemble or probability distribution q over quantum states. And then we can define the training uh, risk or training cost of a parameter setting just as an empirical average. So it's, it's also an expectation value, but the probability measure is like an empirical measure. Um, so you just average the uh, trace distances between output states in your training data set. And now this is something you can in principle evaluate because you have access to these states, right? So, and, and V of alpha is the model you yourself have. So you also have access to these states. Like uh, Alessandro noticed, it's a little bit like whether you can evaluate it easily is a different question. You might need multiple copies of these states um, or you might need almost like classical descriptions of them, but in principle, you can evaluate it. And now our hope or our idea is if this training cost is small, then hopefully also the expected testing risk is small. But when is this the case, right? When is indeed the training cost a good proxy for the expected testing risk? Uh, sorry, there was a question that I. Yes, sir. Yeah, if uh, from our P and QR, QR are very different, then this definition of tracing training cost doesn't make any sense, no? That's a yeah. That's exactly uh, one of okay. the two observations. So um, that, that's a very good point. So when is this training cost a good proxy for the testing cost? And this is essentially the question that we ask in generalization. So when can we guarantee small training cost implies small testing cost, uh, small testing risk with, I don't know, reasonably large success probability or something. And there are two variants to this question. Uh, the first is in distribution generalization where P and Q are the same ensemble. And then you might imagine that if the training data size is large enough, we should be good uh, by some law of large numbers kind of argument. Um, it's actually not that straightforward. Like a direct law of large numbers application doesn't give us what we want because the parameter setting is training data dependent. So um, the dependency can come in and that makes it a bit more difficult. But maybe we have a chance. Now, like Joseph observed, if P and Q are not the same and are not related at all, we don't have a chance, right? Then there's nothing we can do. But maybe if P and Q have some relation to each other, even while not being the same, we can hope for the out of distribution generalization version of this, where still a small training risk tells us something about the testing risk and allows us to control it. But this is gonna be harder than in distribution generalization. And I, I just wanna say that in distribution generalization itself is also non-trivial. <clears throat> All right, so this is the mathematical problem setup. Uh, do you have questions about that at the moment? Okay. Looking good, then uh, let me continue. Um, so to kind of figure out uh, what kind of training and testing risks we're going to look at, I have to tell you what data sources we consider. So what, what our ensembles are. And we're working with so-called locally scrambled ensembles. <clears throat> um, let me first give you the definition. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, or let me first give you the intuition. So we're looking at locally scrambled ensembles of either unitaries or states. And a locally scrambled ensemble is one that at least locally is uniformly random over, for example, state space. Uh, that's the idea. What does that mean? Mathematically, we can formalize this as follows. And I, I just want to say we're not the first to use this notion. It's been used before in at least these two papers. Um, we just kind of use it for a different purpose. First, uh, let's look at unitaries. So if you have an ensemble of n qubit unitaries, um, with, and I'll try to consistently write an ensemble with uh, a calligraphic U, 
We call this locally scram scrambled if it is invariant under pre-processing by tensor products of arbitrary local unitaries. So in, in a formula, um, the ensemble satisfies this equation for every possible single qubit unitaries. So in other words, if I first um, apply a tensor product of unitaries, and then I draw a unitary from the ensemble and post-process, uh, sorry, and, and apply it afterwards, it's the same as just drawing a unitary from the ensemble and applying it. So it's a certain invariance property of the ensemble. And for states, you can then define it in basically the same way um, by saying a state ensemble is locally scrambled if it's, the, if it's what you get by starting from the zero state and then applying a unitary drawn from a locally scrambled ensemble. Uh, because of this invariance here, you don't have to start from the zero state. You could start from a different product state, but it's easiest to start from the zero state. Okay, this is a little bit of an abstract definition. Let's go through some examples because I think this uh, illustrates it. So what are state ensembles that are locally scrambled? Um, a simple first one is products of Haar random single qubit states. Because a Haar random, uh, the Haar measure is invariant under unitaries, actually from both sides. So in particular, if you have a single qubit Haar measure unitary and you multiply a fixed unitary from the right, it doesn't change the measure. And uh, since we here require to be invariant with respect to tensor products, if you multiply such a tensor product from the right to a, hard to a product of hard random unitaries, it's going to give you the same measure. So that's why tensor products of single qubit Haar measures um, give you the right kind of invariant structure. Notice that whenever you have a locally scrambled ensemble, you can post-process it um, by a fixed unitary and it's still gonna remain locally scrambled. That's because in the definition, I only required some invariance about pre-processing. And if you post-process, it doesn't change what happens with pre-processing. So you can now, for example, also apply some fixed, possibly entangling unitary afterwards. Um, there's something stronger you could take fully hard random n qubit states. Um, these are like more scrambled than we require because there in particular, you have the invariance with respect to local unitaries, but you even have something stronger if you want. Uh, and then you could interpolate between these examples. So you could have like hard random on k qubits and have like n over k copies of this if you want. So these are some first examples for locally scrambled ensembles. Um, there's also another one that has like some quantum info flavor. Namely, you can take um, output states of random quantum circuits. So if you fix like, let's say a K local quantum circuit architecture, and then randomly draw each of the gates in the circuit from a Haar measure uh, on the respective number of qubits, um, the output state is also going to be locally scrambled. Um, to some, this might be the most natural of these ensembles. I'm not sure, um, but it's also an example. Um, okay, so to, to like finish the discussion of locally scrambled ensembles, let me just say that we actually don't care about locally scrambled overall. We only care about locally scrambled up to and including second complex moments. So what I mean by this is you could also look at ensembles of unitaries, for example, that agree with some locally scrambled ensemble up to and including complex second moments, and all our results go through. Uh, this kind of increases our possible examples a little bit. So namely, for example, we could now look at products of uh, random single qubit stabilizer states, uh, because stabilizer states are um, a two design. Um, they kind of reproduce the moments of the Haar measure on each single qubit, and then they reproduce the moments of uh, the tensor product of Haar measures. And this is a very simple ensemble, right? You can just, I mean, th there's not that many uh, single qubit stabilizer states, so you can easily sample from them uniformly, um, and then you just build tensor products. You could, of course, take any two design um, that's gonna reproduce second moments of the Haar measure by, by definition, um, or you could again like interpolate a little bit and have stabilizers on some k qubits and then have multiple copies. Okay, 
these locally scrambled ensembles um, kind of almost naturally fall into easy and complicated or simple and complex or however, however you want to call it. So for example, tensor products of stabilizer states are a very, very simple to prepare ensemble of states. Um, so are like tensor products of hard random states uh, and probably also the outputs of simple random quantum circuits. And these are probably ensembles that you want to train on because these are states that you can easily prepare. On the other hand, stuff like hard random states, so fully hard random or output states of, of deep random circuits are, are going to be hard to prepare for you. Um, so probably you, you're not going to manage to use them as training data just because you don't have access. But maybe it's still interesting for you how, how you would perform on them. So maybe they're more natural as, as testing ensembles. And then there's the stuff in between um, where like, for example, these interpolated tensor products. And there I'm not sure. I guess it depends on K, uh, whether you can prepare them or not. All right, so these are the ensembles that we're going to look at. And basically what I want you to take away from this is there's this formal definition with the local invariance. And this class of, class of ensembles contains both simple ensembles, like tensor products of stabilizer states, but also more complicated ones, like outputs of deep random circuits. And now that we have these ensembles at hand, I can finally um, tell you about like, the main theoretical results of this work, namely about how risks for different locally scrambled ensembles relate to one another. And so here's the first uh, main result. So we show the following equivalence of locally scrambled ensembles for comparing unitaries. If we have two ensembles P and Q that are locally scrambled up to and including the second moment, then we show that um, for any parameter setting of your variational uh, neural network, of your variational quantum unitary, um, you can both upper and lower bound the risk with respect to P by the risks with respect to Q. And the only thing you have to pay is like a factor of one half in one direction and a factor of two in the other. So essentially, all of these locally scrambled ensembles give rise to equivalent uh, expected testing risks. And the fact that they differ by at most a constant factor is good for us because that means if one of them is small, all the others are also going to be small uh, because usually we don't care about factors of two. So in that sense, this equivalence shows us that for the purpose of comparing unitaries, locally scrambled ensembles are all more or less the same. Sorry, but, but this risk measure was a trace distance. Uh, yes, that's correct. It was like the expected squared distance between like output state of U and output state of V of alpha. Yes, that's right. OK, OK. All right. Um, now, if you want, I can give you a proof sketch. Um, but if you'd rather see some uh, like how this helps you with out of distribution generalization, I can also directly go to that. Um, so it, I don't know, let me, let me know. Do you want to see a proof sketch or keep that for later if there's time? Maybe, yeah, maybe we can keep the proof uh, at the end during the questions. Yeah, so, sounds good. I don't, I don't know if anyone is okay. Yeah. Okay, now I already moved, sorry. <laughs> so. Let me, let me show you how, once you have this result, so once you have this equivalence between all locally scrambled ensembles for comparing unitaries, how this gives you out of distribution generalization. Um, oops. Why does it do that? Okay, interesting. Uh, and the first observation is that if you have this, you can lift in distribution generalization to out of distribution generalization. Okay, what do I mean by this? Um, okay, here's a, a bit of a wall of text. Uh, let's let's try to go through it together. So suppose you have two ensembles, both of which are locally scrambled, and think of one of them as the training ensemble and the other as the testing ensemble. And now we have an unknown n-qubit unitary that we're trying to learn, and we have our ansatz unitary V of alpha trained on training data coming from Q. And what we, what, what we can now show is that you can bound the expected testing risk for the testing distribution P by twice 
the training cost that you incur on this training data coming from Q plus an in-distribution generalization error. And here, an in-distribution generalization error is basically the difference of the expected testing risk for Q and the, expect, uh, and the training cost for Q. So basically, I've just rewritten RQ as training cost plus generalization error, which is true by definition. So this is a very simple rewriting of one of the inequalities from the previous, uh, previous result, or actually both. Um, but it, it has an interesting implication. Namely, it has the following take-home message. If you're interested in unitary learning with respect to locally scrambled ensembles, you can control the out-of-distribution risk by the in-distribution training cost and the in-distribution generalization error. So that means you don't have to worry about the out-of-distribution anymore. You can do everything in the distribution. So, sorry, what is the cost? Uh, the cost was the empirical average of the trace distances over the training data set. Uh, um, okay, yes, yes. Okay, now, uh, okay, as I said, this is essentially a rewriting of the result we already have. Uh, so why, why is it interesting? Um, the reason why, why I think it's interesting um, is the following. So this lifting color, corollary tells us the following. If you have an in-distribution generalization bound for quantum neural networks, here for the case of unitary learning, then every such in-distribution generalization bound automatically gives you an out-of-distribution generalization bound in the locally scrambled case. So in particular, we can take any bound that already exists in the literature and actually any bound that ever will exist in the literature. And whenever those improve, they immediately improve out of distribution generalization guarantees as well. And oh, maybe I should say that, um, okay, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm very, very far from an expert on classical out of distribution generalization in machine learning theory. But I, I'm not aware of, of something like this in classical theory. So here we have like a physically motivated class of distributions. And basically, out of distribution is an automatic consequence of in distribution generalization among these distributions. So that's kind of neat, I believe. Uh, let me give you an example of what happens if you use this. So using a specific um, in distribution generalization bound from the literature, and uh, I use one that I'm familiar with. So I use one from a paper that I've, I've written with a subset of the authors in this paper. Um, we can now just, and the proof is a two line proof really combining the corollaries. Um, we can get the following result. So the, the setup is the same. We have two locally scrambled distributions. We have an n qubit unitary that we're trying to learn and we have our quantum neural network. And now let's assume that in, those, in that quantum neural network, we have T parameterized trainable gates. So for example, T rotation gates with trainable angles. Then we can bound the out of distribution testing risk by twice the training error plus a term that scales roughly like T log T over, uh, square root of T log T over the training data size. And T was the number of trainable gates. So in particular, if your QNN is like efficiently implementable, then you can do it with an efficient amount of training data and you can get this relatively small, all on the assumption that you train. Uh, Joseph, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, why T comes into, into this bound? Because it seems that if you have like more trainable parameters, then it will be more easy for you to learn, no? That you just have like one parameter. Um, so, okay, T comes in because um, in, you, you can think of this a little bit as a trade-off between expressivity and generalization. So if, if you have a model without trainable parameters, you're going to generalize perfectly. So your performance on the data is going to be the same as your performance on new samples. But your performance is probably going to be bad on both because you cannot train. But as you increase the number of parameters, you run the risk of overfitting the training data. Um, oh, okay. And then generalization would be bad. And that's why the generalization error term here depends on the number of parameterized gates. Mm, okay, I see. Thanks. At least intuitively. But there should be like a 
okay, like an, an optimal number of parameters, not depending on the unitary, but too few is not enough, and then too much there is like overfitting. But the, I think that it captures that. It's more general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's 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 true. Okay. Um, yeah, and like I said, this is only one example. You can take any in distribution generalization bound in the literature um, and directly plug it into a framework and then it gives you better bounds. Oh, sorry, not better bounds, but also bounds for out of distribution generalization. Um, all right, so much for the math. Um, let me tell you a little bit about applications and about numerical experiments that my collaborators have, have done with these ideas. Um, but I, I cannot. Um, Help myself, I, I want to tell you about some conceptual implications first. So the first is um, a relevance to, to near-term devices, so to learning quantum processes on NISC devices. Um, here, uh, at least this is my view, um, if you have a NISC architecture and you try to use it to generate training data, you can probably only prepare simple states. So by that, I mean, you're not going to be able to prepare highly entangled states with entanglement over many qubits or something. That, that's not going to be easy for you. So what our results tell you is that cool. It, it's kind of it's 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 okay because uh, simple states can suffice as quantum training data to learn an unknown unitary, even if what you care about is not how the unitary acts on simple states but on more complicated ones. So that means that on NISC devices, you may already be able to provide uh, to prepare the relevant training data. Um, another implication is for classical learning or compiling of unitaries. So here it's a little bit similar. If you try to classically describe your unitary and classically learn it, um, for example, using tensor network methods or something like this, it's probably going to work well for low entangled states, but not for all states. Um, or I don't know, also, if you try to use something like a stabilizer formalism, there's a restricted class of states for which it works. Now, if you, for example, stay in this tensor network image, um, our results tell you that if you're trying to learn a unitary that maps low entangled states to low entangled states, you can learn such a unitary using tensor network methods classically. Because you can train on low entangled states, what you get out of low entangled states, so it's possible with tensor networks to describe. And by our results, even though you only trained on low entangled states, if you pick the right ensembles, you might generalize to ensembles that are more interesting and contain highly entangled states. Um, I say this is a conceptual implication because this hasn't been fleshed out fully yet. And the last one um, that I think is a cool idea is just that we use these physics-inspired ensembles, right? So we, we have these ensembles with the local invariant structure and so on. And these help us find uh, out of distribution generalization. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see that physics gives us some promising ensembles here and to, to see where we can find others. Um, all right, but now let me actually come to the numerics. Um, so this is numerics um, that my colleague Lukas has done. And it's for learning a Heisenberg spin chain Hamiltonian. So the high level goal here is you have some unknown Hamiltonian. You know what it's, uh, you know the form of its summons, but you don't know the prefactors. You don't know the parameters. And you want to learn those, um, but you want to learn those by using the Hamiltonian only to evolve very simple states, in our case, product states. So um, a little bit more detail, the target Hamiltonian that we looked at, <coughs> uh, you can see here. Um, so you have some two-body interactions on, on nearest neighbors, and then you have uh, some single qubit, in, um, single qubit interactions. Um, for, for the numerics, uh, we did like there, there was a specific choice for these parameters, um, and then we acted as if we had forgotten the specific choice and trained the model to, to relearn those. Um, and the specific choice you can see on the bottom if you want. The ansatz here was essentially a trotterization. So you kind of do a short time evolution with some parameters, and then you uh, repeat that multiple times. Um, in this case, we did a second order trotter. So the, the short term unitary is something like uh, some exponentiation with an HB and that sandwiched by exponentiation with HA. And here, HA and HB contain commuting two local terms. So you kind of collect all the Z terms in one of the Hamiltonians, collect all the X terms in the other, um, and that then allows you to, to trotterize. 
so that was the ansatz and then of course how good the ansatz is depends on on l how often you, you repeat this and so on so uh, sorry how small you make the time and correspondingly how you adapt l um let me show you just one plot um so what you see here is on the x-axis the achieved training cost on the y-axis you see an achieved testing risk uh, and you see this for different numbers of qubits going from 4 to 12. And what you see is that as the training cost becomes smaller, um, also the testing risk becomes smaller. So in that sense, the testing cost indeed is a good predictor for the testing risk, um, as it should be in the case of good generalization. And OK, what I want to emphasize is that here we trained on uh, so the test, the, the training cost is with respect to training data coming from tensor products of hard random single qubit states. And what you see is that we evaluated two testing risks. So the dashed line is the indistribution risk uh, with respect to tensor products of hard states. And the, the, the straight lines are with respect to the full harm measure out of distribution risk. And they're extremely well aligned in this um, in this plot here. So you see that also the out of distribution risk goes down as the training cost goes down. And in fact, they're aligned uh, better than our theory predicts. Um, so that's something we've seen in these numerical experiments, but something that I cannot like prove why it's the case. And um, a second application, and for this, um, I'd like to advertise that the paper that I'm talking about today has something like a twin paper. Um, they came out on the, on the archive on the same day. Um, and it's the same author list but permuted because um, this was really more uh, pushed forward by, by Joe and Zoe um, and it's using these results for dynamical simulation. <clears throat> so here the high level goal is to uh, have an efficient procedure for simulating long time quantum evolutions and our high level idea is you have a time dependent quantum neural network and crucially it has two features. The first is it can learn the short time evolution from simple data. The second is that it, it depends on time in a way that naturally allows you to extrapolate to large times. The way we do this here is by a diagonalization ansatz. So that means we have, um, we diagonalize a unitary and the kind of the unitaries that give you the basis, so the Ws here, are time independent, parameterized, but time independent. And then you have the diagonal with the eigenvalues. And that's time dependent now. And the time dependence is kind of clear. It's e to the minus i t and then the, some parameters. And this you can kind of train on short times and then extrapolate to larger times. And our out of distribution generalization results kind of justify training it on very simple states. Um, and here is a, a, a figure from that paper. Um, this is um, numerics that we did for, if I remember correctly, this was a four qubit Heisenberg Hamiltonian um, without a magnetic field, I think. So also some like nearest neighbor interactions. And uh, what you, I, I just want to talk shortly about the plot on the, on the top. So this A, again, on the x-axis, you have a training loss or a training cost. And on the y-axis you have in a different notation, the testing risk. And what you see here is that if the number of, of training data points is not large enough, um, you're not going to get a good correspondence between the two, right? So the training, uh, the training cost goes down, but the testing risk stays up there. But as, as soon as you reach like, a, or at least in these numerics, as soon as you reach a critical number, so it, as soon as you have enough training data, um, it begins to work well. And again, here the training is with respect to products, whereas the testing is with respect to entangled states. So again, you see the out of distribution generalization at work. And in fact, we use this to kind of uh, propose a what we call a resource efficient algorithm for forced for fast forwarding a, an evolution, so for evolving for long times. And this, in uh, at least in some scenarios, outperforms trotterization uh, quite significantly. But if you're interested in that, I, I recommend taking a look at the paper I linked here. So now let me um, conclude uh, my talk. So. What did I tell you about today? Um, I told you about basically the following things. First of all, I told you how different locally scrambled ensembles are equivalent for unitary learning. And that this kind of implies that 
automatically in distribution generalization guarantees for unitary learning can be lifted to out of distribution generalization among locally scrambled ensembles. And then um, this has like the conceptual implication that you can learn a unitary even on complex states by training only on simple states. And I showed you um, some numerical implications or some numerical experiments demonstrating this. Now, um, this work is something like a, a first attempt at out of distribution generalization and variational QML. So there's many, many open questions. Um, some of them are the following. So first of all, we look specifically at unitary learning and specifically at locally scrambled ensembles. So you could ask, is, how, how specific is this feature? Um, so can you do it for other tasks or for other ensembles? Uh, a second question is just, where else could this uh, out of distribution generalization be useful in quantum machine learning? Um, like, do you have further concrete applications? And I think like the, the biggest open question is how do you import ideas from the classical machine learning literature? Because there's uh, some insightful work on classical out of distribution generalization. Unfortunately, like I said before, I'm not an expert and I don't know this well enough, which is why we couldn't incorporate it here. But my understanding is that they use different techniques. So in, in particular, they don't have like these physically motivated ensembles, but they develop some specific algorithms and so on. And Maybe incorporating these ideas also in the quantum world could, could um, lead to new insights on out-of-distribution generalization. All right. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, now I'm very much looking forward to your questions on what I told you about. Thanks so much, Matthias. Has uh, anyone questions? Uh, yes. So. Um... I'm wondering if you could ha uh, have a classical counterpart of the locally scrambled ensemble. Do you have such a counterpart? Um, I think it depends on what kind of data you have. But what you could definitely do, okay, this, this is going to take a while. Uh, so what you could definitely do is if you have, if your data comes from a space that has something like an invariant structure. So let's say you're your data comes from some hypersphere in a real space or so, then, um, and, and it has a symmetry under rotations, for example, then you could try and um, do something similar. So try and, and implement or require an invariance property for, for the distribution. And maybe if you have such symmetry properties for the distributions that helps. So in principle, you could define this also classically. I, I have to admit, I haven't seen it. Uh, classically. Yeah, and, and for us, it's kind of fortunate that this locally scrambled property conspires very well with the kind of loss that we're looking at in terms of the square trace distance or the fidelity, however you want to see it. So also probably it would depend on what loss you look at in the classical machine learning setting. Um, at least I would imagine. Okay, I, I have a, another question. Um, well, there is a claim that I think I didn't fully understood is uh, when you say that um, in the training set, uh, we can just allow like simple states like uh, low uh, unentangled states. So in the first sight, this is not surprising no? that then you can predict like a uh, more complex state because if you learn like a basis of the unitary, then this should be enough. So we're missing something yeah. here. No, that, that's a very good point. Um, so in some sense, my claim is, is trivial. If you learn the unitary on a certain exponential number of product states, then, OK, if you learn it on a basis, you learn the whole unitary, and it works. Uh, that, that's completely right. Um, the good thing is that um, you don't need exponentially many of those states, at, at least for, whoops, OK, this is going to take ages, um, at least for certain unitaries of interest. Mm -hmm. So for example, this result here uh, roughly tells you that if you have a unitary that can be implemented with a polynomial number of gates, um, then you have a chance of doing it using only polynomially many simple states also. Mm -hmm. um, 
so in that way you can you can get away with less so uh, than, it doesn't de depend on the complexity of the input data also for example if i put like entangled states this is not gonna help just um, instead of training with uh yeah. so uh let me see yeah, I think it's not going to help too much, at least in this specific scenario. I, I think that's essentially what our results mm. tell you, that the entangled states cannot outperform the product states by too mm. much. Yeah, because one of my question was is if entangled money in the training site can help or not. But Yeah, okay. so, I mean, um, the, I, it, it can help. Um, I think it cannot help too much. <laughs> but what, what we do not consider is um if your training set is like a subset of a larger system and kind of you have you you're you're you have access to a subsystem and train on that and maybe it's entangled with some other system uh mm. that kind of entanglement we don't consider in this work um i'm trying to remember whether there are some papers that consider it but i'm not sure um so I don't know, maybe, maybe there's something along these lines um, where, where the entanglement could help. Okay, thanks. I don't know if anyone else has questions. So, uh... Maybe I can still ask something. So, sure. so this local scrambledness means that you're your training set kind of locally kind of investigates the state base kind of mm -hmm. efficiently because it's kind of, because it's like uniformly distributed over the state space locally. Yeah. So is this yeah I understand this is the this is the reason why why you can generalize from these kind of simple these kinds of sets to to kind of the yes. more yeah, like, I mean, um, it, it is definitely uh, like a crucial part. So in particular, like in our proofs, this local scrambledness is, is used very heavily. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether you could find like other distributions, uh, sorry, other assumptions that replace this local scrambledness um, to achieve something similar. Um, I'd be a bit, Right. At least, okay. At least our proofs are tuned to it in in some sense. Uh, okay. Sorry. I guess I interrupted you before you actually asked your question. So. No, I'm not sure if I had a good question at all. I was kind of just wondering the whole. But maybe we don't. I'm not sure if we have time for the proof anymore. But it's kind of maybe I should look uh, look at the paper. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. Can I give a can I give a feeling for it? So okay, maybe what I what I can say is just this. So the main technical result that we actually show. So what I said before is all locally scrambled ensembles are essentially equivalent. Um, what we actually show is uh, that all locally scrambled ensembles are equivalent to the one you get when doing the global har when looking at the global har measure, and this is like the the central uh, technical result. So th that means like averaging over these locally scrambled things is for the purpose of comparing these unitaries almost the same as averaging over the globally scrambled stuff. Um, and, and this is like the, I, I would say this is the important or the, the important technical observation. Um, yeah, and the proof, um, heavily relies on the local scrambledness and I'm not so sure what of it you could recover if you change the assumption. I mean, you could probably make it robust to some approximation, like if you're only uh, approximately locally scrambled, if you find a reasonable definition of this, um, but I'm not entirely sure what else you could change for the proof to still work. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, you need some kind of an, some kind of invariance for yes for this to happen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Well, so I think let's uh, 
thank Matthias again uh, with a virtual round of applause.